Hi everyone, my name is Alicia. Um, I'm a rising fourth year medical student at Rowan, which is a little school in New Jersey. I'm here to talk to you about my research, which was a systematic review of the cutaneous microbiome in acne. Um, so here's just an overview of everything we'll be going through. I don't have any disclosures. Um, so to begin, acne vulgaris, it's a pervasive dermatologic disease characterized by inflammation of the sebaceous units. It has a pretty significant global burden of disease um, in 2019 with 117.4 million cases of acne vulgaris worldwide, and it also has a pretty significant economic burden um, with the AID calculating $1.2 billion in expenses related to acne vulgaris and its treatments. Um, so what contributes to acne? I'm sure I don't have to tell anyone here, uh, but it's multifactorial. Age, location of the lesions, hormones, bacteria, the environment, the gut microbiome, nutrition, and the cutaneous microbiome, which leads me into the cutaneous microbiome. What does this mean? Um, so the skin is the physical barrier. As we know, it prevents pathogens from entering our bodies. Um, it's the largest organ in the body. And when I say pathogens, I mean bacteria, viruses, fungi, but it also provides a home to many of these organisms that live commensally. Um, and the microbiome basically refers to how these species interact based on their unique characteristics and how they promote or deter the interaction of um, alternative species. Um, and so we all know that Cutibacterium acnes, or C. acnes, plays a role in acne pathogenesis. It's a gram-positive lipophilic anaerobe, and it sort of functions by um, transforming sebum into free fatty acids from which it can thrive. Um, and so microbial diversity, we're typically talking about dysbiosis or symbiosis, and we can measure it in terms of alpha and beta diversity. Alpha diversity meaning the diversity within a specific sample. It's often measured by the Shannon Index. And beta diversity, uh, which is the difference between two samples. And so that's just some terminology we're going to need for uh, this presentation. Um, so what is already known, acne resistance, antibiotic resistance, excuse me, is on the rise. Antibiotics may not be as effective as we think for acne vulgaris, and microbial dysbiosis is linked to a weakened skin barrier. And what needs to be studied? How individual differences in the cutaneous microbial composition affect disease and disease severity. Um, leading me into the objectives for our review, the relationship between acne and the cutaneous microbiome, addressing existing um, therapeutics and how they modulate the microbiome as a means of treatment, and looking at the potential for any new treatments based on a mechanism of modulating the cutaneous microbiome. Um, so I sort of went through our research question, but we used PRISMA guidelines, uh, two databases in the past 10 years with the following search string. Um, and our exclusion criteria was basically anything that was based on the gut microbiome. We really wanted to focus on the cutaneous microbiome, anything that was non-acne, um, and anything that was viral or fungal, we focused on just bacterial. Um, we had two independent reviewers go through full text appraisal. Um, our primary outcomes, we sort of broke it into three, so the presence or absence of specific bacterial communities, um, microbial changes after using existing treatments, and then um, the improvement in treatments in certain new therapeutics, which I'll go through. Um, the chart at the right is the level of evidence from which we were able to uh, sort of uh, select for each study. Um, and then we, oh, I'm sorry, secondary outcomes were uh, changes in diversity index, which I talked about being alpha and beta. Um, we used the JBI critical appraisal checklist, which I have a screenshot of here uh, as an example, just to do risk of bias to ensure that all of the studies we selected were of high quality. Um, and we ended up doing a qualitative analysis, uh, which is not preferred in a systematic review. We would have preferred a quantitative analysis with more concrete statistical results. The reason we had to choose a qualitative analysis was due to pretty significant heterogeneity among the studies regarding the sample selection um, methods, the sample selection locations, and the different classification systems that were used, such as genus versus species per um, bacteria. So for our results, we ended up including 26 articles. And uh, this is a little bit overwhelming, but I'm going to go through it quickly and then summarize it on the next slide. So basically, we broke it down into the first set of results, which was the role of the microbiome in acne. And um, to no one's surprise, C. acnes was sort of predominant, which was well understood in the literature. Um, but what was interesting is certain uh, ribotypes of C. acnes that are sort of pro-acne and some that are a little bit protective against acne. And then also some different species and how they interact um, primarily uh, Staph aureus, Staph epidermidis, um, and then also some diversity uh, facets at the bottom. 
So what does this mean? The main species, like I said, were C. acnes, uh, the RT4 and RT5, RT8 and 10, but primarily RT4 and 5 were associated with acne lesions. Um, these specific ribotypes were found to have uh, a specific gene that confers resistance to tetracycline antibiotics, um, as well as a plasmid uh, introduced into their genome that was supposed to show um, increased virulence. Um, and so that was one thing that was noted. RT6, which is just a specific ribotype that was uh, protective against acne. And then the I1A phylotype, again, increased biofilm adhesions, biomass, and antibi antibiotic resistance. This phylotype was seen more in acne patients. Some other bugs, uh, we saw a commensal effect between C. granulosum and C. acnes, meaning they were supporting one another. Um, sort of an antagonistic effect between C. acnes and Staph aureus, as well as Staph epidermidis. And some gram-negative bugs that I have listed here uh, were also found to be more prevalent in patients with severe acne in certain papers, uh, which is contradictory to what people typically understand of the gram-positive C. acnes. Um, and then diversity indices. Most of our previous um, studies on the cutaneous microbiome, which are limited, had shown that there was a decreased alpha diversity seen in acne lesions, meaning increased diversity in healthy skin. Um, we actually found the opposite in a majority of our studies, which uh, was fairly interesting. Um, so this is the second set of results, which looks at the existing treatments on the cutaneous microbiome. Uh, so PO, doxycycline, benzoyl peroxide, isotretinoin, and supramolecular salicylic acid. Um, out of all of these studies, they all resulted in clinical improvements in acne lesions. Uh, they all resulted in some sort of shift in the microbiome um, in terms of general prevalence of certain bugs. And then, uh, interestingly, they all had different effects on alpha diversity. So you can see doxycycline had an increase in alpha diversity with an uh, improvement in the lesions. The benzoyl peroxide groups pretty much decreased alpha diversity even though they had an improvement in lesions. Um, the isotretinoin paper did not comment on diversity, and the supersalicylic acid, um, one of them showed an increase in both alpha and beta diversity. So again, what does this mean? Uh, the four drugs that we were able to identify having research on the cutaneous microbiome, um, again, they all had clinical improvements in lesions, and they had clinical changes and shifts in the prevalence of the big bugs um, that we were seeing. Um, and then the effects on the alpha diversities were somewhat mixed. And lastly, uh, the third set of results, which I find the most interesting, were implications for future treatments. So we were able to identify some studies that used topical probiotics or other topical modulators um, that function to improve acne by means of modulating the cutaneous microbiome. Um, the top four being, I'm sorry, the top five being uh, probiotics, mostly lactobacillus, which many of us know uh, lives on our skin uh, commensally, but also E. faecalis. They did a split face study and showed significantly improved um, lesions on the side that was treated with the topical probiotic there, um, as well as specific C. acne strains such that some uh, strains of C. acnes are pro-acne and some are sort of protective against acne. And then at the bottom here, there were two interesting studies. One, uh, this is a plant extract that we identified that was previously known to have antimicrobial activity. They tried it as a topical therapy and it improved lesions. And the same goes for uh, the bottom, this protein derivative um, also found to have antimicrobial activity. They put it on the skin. They had improvement in lesions um, with a significant decrease in uh, inflammatory markers. Um, so again, what does this mean? Is there a role for emerging treatments? I think yes, but also not quite, or not quite there. Um, the reason I say that is those were the only studies I was able to find, and also they were pretty limited sample sizes, if you took a note in the table. Um, I do think topical probiotics may have a role in potential, uh, potentially treating acne, but I think we need um, much more rigorous studies on, uh, with larger sample sizes and more diverse populations and more basic science research. Um, looking at exactly how this modulation is occurring, if it's causal or if it's just a trend that we're seeing. Um, so to conclude, uh, we did find in the three sections of our results that there is an impact of the cutaneous microbiome and its shift on acne development. How strong, we're not sure because we weren't able to do that quantitative analysis. Um, and then there is a notable impact on the way that our existing therapeutics modulate, uh, but we're just not so sure that the alpha diversity and beta diversities are the main mechanism of how that's occurring. Um, and then also the role for topical cutaneous modulators shows promise, but is deserving of um, significantly more research. 
Um, so future directions I sort of talked about. Um, I think there's a lot out there on the gut microbiome, but I'd like to see more on the cutaneous microbiome and how all of the different things that we put on our skin and all of the different exposures we have are affecting that, uh, that microbiome. Um, and mostly more specifics on mechanisms of how all of this is occurring, which would really come down to basic science research. Um, limitations, as I had mentioned to uh, my team's review, was the qualitative approach to analysis. Um, we are working on doing at least a quantitative analysis in the middle section where we looked at the existing therapies and their effects, um, but having some trouble with the numbers there. Um, we fear that there may be too many confounding variables just based on the significance of the heterogeneity amongst the different studies. Um, and then only two databases were used uh, in this study. Um, so I wanted to say thank you for the Acne Rosacea Society and the Society for Investigative Dermatology for having me up here today, as well as all of my co-authors um, who have been a big help to this paper. And all of the references here are, could be scanned. <laughs>